get two fox you didn't know? Thanks, Emily. Can I get a carabiner too for my backpack? Yes. Amazing. What a good friend. Well, good morning, Grace Commons. It's great to be here with you all. Uh, for those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Kelsey Willega. I get to co-direct our young adult ministry. And if you've been wondering what young adults have been up to this summer, we've been in a kickball league. We're currently sitting in third place, going into our final week. Thank you, thank you. There's only four teams. <laughs> we're not last, so we're not last. That's all that matters. Um, also, I'll give this a disclaimer before uh, the sermon begins. I'm going to be out of breath because of pregnancy and a baby pushing on my lungs. I'm okay. I'm okay if I'm out of breath. I just, just gonna give that disclaimer now. I'm gonna sound out of breath because I am. So, uh, this morning we are finishing our series looking at what has, been what has become known as the Great Commission that we find at the end of Matthew's Gospel. And in the Great Commission, Jesus gives the disciples and us a very clear call and directive to go and make disciples. But in the Great Commission, Jesus is doing more than just telling us what we should be doing around here. He's also giving us a framework of what it looks like to be his disciples. In order to make disciples, we have to first be disciples. So let's go ahead and take a look at Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20 as a refresher. And here's what Matthew writes. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Throughout the series, we've pulled out three aspects of what it looks like to be a disciple beyond making disciples. Disciples of Jesus are marked by submitting to the authority of Jesus, obeying the commands of Jesus, and relying on the constant presence of Jesus. And out of that, we are then able to go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to do the same. And what we'll be looking at this morning is Jesus' very last words in this passage, where Jesus says, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And I believe it's no mistake that the Gospel of Matthew ends with this final statement of Jesus. Because when Matthew was writing this Gospel, he wanted to make it abundantly clear to his audience, an audience that was primarily Jewish, that the God of Israel, who has long been with his people, this God will continue to be with his people through Jesus. Throughout the Old Testament, there are over a hundred mentions of God being with his people. And that doesn't even include the phrasing and times where it's mentioned that God is amidst or before or among his people. One of the main things that has always set God's people apart from others is that God, that this God is with his people. One commentator noted that when the people of God throughout the Old Testament are proclaiming that God is with them, they are reasserting their central identity as God's people. And many commentators even point out that the Great Commission found at the end of Matthew resembles the commission narratives that occur throughout the Old Testament where God's often reluctant and inadequate servants are sent out to fulfill his purpose with the assurance of his empowering presence with them always. So it seems that Matthew is trying to make clear that the withness of God is not, an isolate, is not isolated to just the people of Israel. The withness of God will continue to be a reality for God's people because of and through Jesus. And it's no mistake that Jesus' statement of, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age, echoes the title with which he was first introduced in Matthew, which was Emmanuel, God with us. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Now, as I've been working on the sermon, here's what I've been wrestling with. Am I relying on the constant presence of Jesus? Am I living like the empowering presence of Jesus is with me always? As someone who says they're a disciple of Jesus, submits to his authority, obeys his commands, works for a church and preaches, am I living and acting like Jesus is with me always? I really want to lie and say yes. But I think my answer is yeah, sometimes, but also no. I get stressed and anxious and worried about circumstances in my life, like buying and selling a house and bringing a new life into the world. I get overwhelmed when it feels like I don't have the right answer and know-how for something. I get impatient or envious or even mean with people. Sorry, Cody, but that one's mostly towards him. I'm not always living like the empowering presence of Jesus is with me. And I have a feeling that I'm not the only one in here who can say that that's true of them as well. Which then leads me to wonder, then how do we live like God's presence is with us always? What does that actually practically look like to live like God is with us always? Let's pray first and then see what the Lord would reveal to us this morning. So God, we are grateful that you are with us always. Lord, we pray that you would remind us of that truth this morning. Lord, would you help us see how it is we can be reminded of this in our daily lives, our daily interactions with others. It's in your glorious and powerful name we pray. Amen. Recently, pregnancy, all things babies, have mostly taken up my thought life and my brain space. And this is strange, but one of the things I've been thinking about recently is how jarring it must be for a baby to be born. Not for the mom, for the baby. For nine months, this baby has been living the good life. There's an unending supply of nutrients. They're just sloshing around in their own personal hot tub. They're literally attached to mom, so they feel comforted by her constant presence, her voice, her smell, all the sounds that her insides make throughout the day. And it's dark in there, which that must be nice to not be assaulted by bright lighting. These babies, they're doing just fine living inside of their mother's womb. But then one day, all of that comes to a jarring end. All of, their, all of a sudden, their dark, cozy, warm, tight living space ejects them into a room lit with the most awful and bright fluorescent lighting. There's strangers everywhere, noises that are no longer muffled. Their nutrient supply is literally cut off. And now they have to adjust to this new way of being out in the world. They're no longer in the safe confines of their mother's womb with her constant love and presence. Jarring, right? And what I keep thinking about is that even though it's now different for the baby, it is then the job of that baby's caregiver to remind that baby that they are still with them and they still love them. And when I think about this with Holland, I think about how she was placed right on my chest after she was born, to remind her that even though she's in a strange new world, I'm still with her, and I still love her. And then through those first few weeks when she cried from hunger or discomfort or just because she needed someone, Cody and I were there to remind her that we're with her and we love her. And even in the first few months, when, after the first few months when we sleep trained her, we did cry it out, we would go in after a period of her crying and rub her back or rub her belly and tell her that we still love her, we're still with her. And over the last 20 months, Holland has learned that when she can't see us or hear us, she knows that we're still with her and we still love her. She knows that when she falls down and scrapes her knee for the 12th time that day and she cries out for us, we are there with her and we love her. She knows that even when we drop her off at daycare in the morning, we will be there later that day to remind her that we are still with her and we love her. She knows even when we put her to bed at night and close the door that we are just on the other side and she trusts that we are still with her and we love her. Now a baby being ejected from their mother's womb isn't a direct correlation but it does help me have a little bit of compassion and empathy for what the disciples must have been feeling at the end of Matthew's gospel. 
For years, the disciples had been physically with Jesus. They believed he was sent by God to be their savior and their king, but then he died. Jesus had been physically with them for years, but then Jesus was crucified and the disciples scattered. Jesus was no longer with them. And over the last few days, some of them were seriously doubting their decision to follow Jesus. His death and absence didn't yet make sense to them. They weren't really sure what to do or even what was going to happen next. But then Jesus rose from the dead, the tomb was empty, and Jesus directed his disciples to the top of a mountain and gave them some final instructions. Make disciples, baptize them, teach them in my way. Also, all authority has been given to me. Obey my commands. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I am still with you, and I still love you. He's telling them that things will be different now. Jesus will no longer be physically present with them, but he is assuring them that he's not abandoning them. He's not leaving them. His presence will still be with them. He's still with them, and he still loves them. He's giving them tall orders and instructions of what to do next and assuring them that he is with them as they do what he has instructed. No matter what will be thrown their way, and much will be thrown their way. They will be persecuted and killed for the message they have been told to spread, but they have been promised that Jesus is with them always. Jesus never said that their life would be easy, that they would get everything they wanted or desired. He promised his presence. He promised to be with them always. And in the gospels, it's been recorded that Jesus told his disciples, even before this, that he would be leaving. He wouldn't always be here, but, He would send an advocate, an helper, someone even greater than he was. He was promising to send them the Holy Spirit. For those who believe in and follow Jesus, we've been given the promised Holy Spirit that is God's empowering presence with us. God with us always. He's never far away. He is always here. So what does that really mean? How does that change things? What does this practically look like in our daily lives? Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, has a few prayers, and one of the prayers is for the Ephesians to understand and live out of the empowering presence found within them. Here's what Paul prays. This is Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14, if you want to follow along. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is Paul's second prayer in the letter to the Ephesian church. In his first, he prayed that they would be able to know and to grasp the power of Christ that is at work among them. And in this prayer that follows, he desires that they would not only know and grasp the power of Christ at work among them, but that they would experience that power at work and apply it to their lives. Paul desires that they would know and experience the power they have access to through the Holy Spirit and how this power impacts their daily lives. Paul desires that they would be strengthened by this power in everything that they do. And in verse 16, Paul prays, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. This prayer is about drawing upon what God has already provided through his spirit, his empowering presence with us always. And Paul is praying that we would be strengthened in our inner being by this power to face whatever comes our way in this world. And this power is not from us. This is not something that we can muster up on our own. 
This is power that exists within us through the Holy Spirit. This prayer is so that the Ephesians, and by extension us, would be reminded that God's empowering presence is with us always through every moment, good and bad, that this life throws our way. God's empowering presence with us always. And Paul continues and he prays, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. The original Greek word that's used for dwell here refers to residing or a habitation. It's referring to a permanent stay, not a temporary stay, not an Airbnb. This is a permanent residence. Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. He lives within us. He is with us always. And in this dwelling of Christ, in his presence, we are being rooted and grounded in love. One commentator wrote that being rooted in God's love provides a stability and security from which to grow. Christ's presence with us always, Christ's love with us always. And from this presence and from this love, we are able to continually grow and mature as his disciples more and more into his likeness each day. And then he continues in verses 18 and 19, and he prays, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This prayer suggests the limitlessness of all we've been given in Christ, And that Christ's empowering presence with us helps us comprehend this limitlessness. I don't know if that's a word, but I'm using it. It works. Christ's love and his power and his presence with us always. And it doesn't make sense. This is hard for us to comprehend and understand. But there is a limitlessness of Christ that is within us. There is no end to it. And Paul desires that through Christ's empowering presence, we would understand this and live accordingly. And all of this surpasses knowledge. It goes beyond knowledge. We don't have to understand this mystery to have relational depth with Christ that then leads to action that is empowered by God's love and presence within us. Paul's desire here in this prayer, and in many ways, this whole letter to the Ephesians, is that God's love, his presence, his power, his wisdom would so permeate every part of our lives that we would become mature as individuals and as a community. That our way of life would be so filled with the fullness of God that it would stand in stark contrast to the world around us. And then Paul ends by praying, not to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly, far more than we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The original Greek for abundantly far more, it's an exaggerated phrase meaning very much in excess or beyond all measure. And this, pow- and this is the power that's at work within us. It's in excess. It's beyond all measure. God's empowering presence, God with us, this power and this presence is beyond anything that we could ask for, that we could even think to ask for or imagine. And this presence, this power, this love enables us to daily submit to God's authority, to obey all of his commands, to remember that he is with us always and to go and make disciples. His presence and his power is what enables us to live out of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, faithfulness, gentleness. His presence and his power is what enables us to navigate a world where pain and sin and suffering and evil still exist. His presence and his power is what enables us to live out of the fullness of God. And the way we live like Jesus' empowering presence is with us always is simply to be with Jesus, to spend time with Jesus. We can't live like Jesus' empowering presence is with us always if we don't know the one whose presence is within us. 
Hala knows that Cody and I are with her and we love her even when she is away from us because of all the time we spend together. And in that time we spend together, we remind Holland that we are with her and we love her. It's the same with Jesus. And being with Jesus involves coming to him in prayer, not only talking, but also listening. It involves coming to scripture so that we continue to learn more about Jesus and what it looks like to follow in his ways and to obey his commands. It involves being around others who follow Jesus and sharing life with them. We will live out of the fullness of God, out of his empowering presence as we spend time with him and come to know him more fully. It won't just happen to us. We have to put in the effort and we will mess up. We will not always get it right. We'll get anxious and stressed. We'll grow impatient. We'll yell at our kids or our spouse or the person who just cut us off. We will have days where joy and peace feel like foreign concepts. The point, though, is that we are growing towards maturity. We are already rooted and grounded in Christ's love, and now it's a matter of growing from that point, learning how to live out of God's empowering presence. And we do this by spending time with Jesus, learning from him, submitting to him, and becoming like him. And for the rest of the fall, we're going to be in a series called Journey with Jesus. And throughout this fall, we'll all be led through different practices and ways of being with Jesus and experiencing the witness and the love of Jesus that is with us always. So if you have no idea where to start or where to begin with experiencing this empowering presence, then stick around this fall and learn with us. Because none of us really know what we're doing. We're all just kind of stumbling around trying to figure it out. So stick around this fall as we learn how to be on this journey with Jesus together, how to live out of his empowering presence with us always. So let's pray, and then we'll continue singing together. Lord, we are grateful. Grateful for you, grateful for your power, grateful for your presence, grateful for the gift of the Holy Spirit that you have given us. Lord, would you help remind us that you are with us always. You are not far off. You are not distant. And Lord, would you guide us and lead us as we seek to live out of your empowering presence each day.